to understand the Sri Lankan government's point of view, the prince sat down with Namal Rajapaksha, son of Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha and nephew of President Godabaya Rajapaksha. Here's what he had to say. <laughs> So my first question for you is, how did we get here? I mean, see, it's a, it's a very long term uh, thing, I believe, uh, because, you know, ever since independence, uh, there were a lot of things that was happening in our country. And I think um, some people say it's a crisis that was built within the last two years. But I personally believe it's something that came and we walked into it. I think uh, simply because of inconsistency of policies that different governments have taken in Sri Lanka. I mean, for example, between 2005, 2015, uh, even though we were fighting against LTT or terrorist organization, we still managed to have a very rapid infrastructure development. But then the government came afterwards, decided no infrastructure development is not going to be the way forward. And they had a different plan. Then this government came, President Godabi Rajapaksa's government, and you know, we had to go through COVID-19 pandemic. And that actually cut down a lot of our investments and also tourism was massively dropped for example it was a five billion dollar industry for us which dropped for 100 million dollars so you know different different decisions that were taken during uh, many many leaders you know and and now um, uh, sri lanka has come to this state but i believe it's something that we have to work together and come out of it hmm. so what is the solution where what are your plans what are the government's plans now well, let's see, as, as the government, as you know, the prime minister and the president uh, has decided that the cabinet has to resign. And we will go for a fresh cabinet reshuffle, uh, hopefully by first week of, I mean, by next week, the new cabinet will be appointed. And the central bank governor has changed, the finance secretary has changed. And there's a, a very prominent advisory committee appointed by the president, especially in restructuring, uh, in discussions with IMF and also how to restructure our economy. So I, pers I personally believe in the long run, we need to have a system change. So when I say system change, the question is, what is the system that we want to change? Is it the politicians only or is it the administration st structure? So I personally believe we need to change the administration structure. You know, we, we do have a very vibrant administration, administration in this country, but it has to be revamped and upgraded. Uh, to face the modern challenges. So without doing that, uh, you know, there is no point of change in the faces. I mean, a lot of public anger is directed directly at your family. Um, what do you have to say about that? Well, I don't blame them because see, if you look at the, the current government, uh, the president and the prime minister is uh, from my family. So it's natural for them to blame the existing government uh, when something goes wrong. And I think uh, it's something we have to face. It's political as well. So I believe politically we need to face and our family and our party and our system has faced many challenges like this many years ago. So this is, uh, you know, it's a challenge and I think we need to be with the people, talk to them, hear them. There are a lot of youngsters, you know, even though they're angry, but they come up with a lot of good ideas, you know, we need to listen to them and also take this opportunity to re do a reboot in our system. We had a golden opportunity after 2009 war ended, then uh, right after COVID-19 pandemic. But I think this is the third chance. So the community itself is demanding for a change. So you need to check, take this opportunity and do the restructuring that can address the demands of the younger generation or the generation, uh, uh, modern generation. And I think uh, moving forward, appointing the cabinet, going through the IMF process, uh, restructuring the economy, you know, those things will happen. But the question is, are we going to make it permanent? So for permanent solution, I think it is time for us politicians and the society uh, to think of upgrading the system and make it in power for youngsters to come into the system, you know, professionals to come into the system and make it more simplified, you know, and make it more investment friendly and you know, think, think progressively. So this is something that I think we need to work out uh, during this time. It feels like what's happening with your family is the, the downside of what happens when one family is in power in a democracy. So what are the checks and balances that you expect to see from the opposition? And also there are, you know, accusations of corruption and other such things. What do you have to, so where, where, where's the balance? See, the family governing is a perception that was built by uh, the opposition. 
you know it's, it's not this is not the first time you know the family one family has been elected many members of one family been elected because none of us are appointed except for the finance uh, minister and he cop he 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 restructured the slp pa political party but all of us are elected by people the only problem is that we all carry the same surname i mean i don't think that is going to be you know that is fair enough from fair from other side uh, to say that one family is governing the country because the cabinet is responsible and cabinet is not for people from the same family we have 30 members in the cabinet 157 in the government sector or the other government ruling party coalition so the decisions are taken collectively but unfortunately in politics you know it's been interpreted as uh, differently and you know that's how the blame game work with the opposition india has the uh, same period like that in the past but even now uh, in, in, even in india even in regional countries you know there are certain accusations like that uh, targeting different different political leaders if not their families but you know those are politically motivated and politically established you know because that's how the opposition work and corruption we were investigated by the last government uh, last government wrote letters to many countries to say to see whether we have foreign accounts but we were all proven you know those all allegations were proven wrong so in politics it's it's something that we have to face and there needs to be a stronger opposition well i mean i will i will always say we need to have a strong opposition but at the same time i think we need a progressive opposition as well you know it's not about being strong and toppling governments this is what happened in sri lanka for the last 74 years you build a strong opposition you for you topple the government then you carry on the same system but it hasn't done anything good to us i mean we still can't uh, we do, we still don't have private universities in our country but we have 2 billion dollars spent by students to go and study abroad and renewable energy is something that we all talk about but our laws and regulation doesn't allow private investors to come and put mega scale renewable energy projects and when you talk about private investments privatizing or public private partnership there's a big massive misinterpretation uh, in the system so if you don't let the private sector grow and if you don't allow them to come and grow with a uh, uh, government sector you know that it's going to be very difficult to have a Uh, progressive economic growth in the country so this is something that we need to think and this is something that all political parties has to come together uh, because there is no point you having a strong opposition you topple a government then you carry on the same system right uh at what point did you realize that public anger was just boiling over and do you feel alienated from the people and from the country Well, see, I don't feel alienated at all because we have gone through this. Even in 2015, I've gone through this. I was demanded thrice by the previous government, and this is something you know we had to face as 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 a, as politicians, whether in the ruling party or not. Uh, but we realized this few months ago. I mean, few years ago actually, in 2015, uh, 2020 months, the parliament election was um, over. you know i suggested certain things to the government as well to some of the senior politicians as well certain changes that we need to do but unfortunately uh, the system doesn't uh, accept it you know it's not only the politicians but the system itself as i said uh, we need to do a system reboot and think think how we how are we going to restructure administration uh, in a very progressive way so it will allow to address certain issues immediately and make it more investment friendly so the foreign investments can come into the country and create more employment and uh, make the economy more stable what do you personally want to see from the president as this amid this crisis well, i think one thing is uh, the president has to be strong and he has to stand with his word with his team which he's doing now and he has to also address the nation and uh, give his plan you know people want to listen to it people want to know what is he's up to what he's going to do what is his plan the one of the biggest accusations we have is that we don't inform people which i agree i mean we should have uh, the relevant ministers officials should have uh, been more open and more vocal as to what is their plan is going to be and how are they going to face these kind of challenges because this is not a challenge that sri lanka is facing on its own we uh, globally this challenge is there you know inflation rates gases gas diesel pricing the or crude oil prices are going up so the inflation is there globally with the pandemic and of course now with the russian ukraine issue so this is nothing to hide from people so i think um, one of the mistakes we did was not being vocal 
about the real situation and what is our plan to face it. You know, many people who I spoke to was on the street. You know, some of the boys went to the protest. After the protest, they came and met me here itself. You know, and say we went to the protest. I said, fine. Now, what do you, what do you want? So they want a plan. What is your plan? How are we going to how are how are we going to come out of this mess? So uh, that is something I think the president and the government has to do. Uh, what is your message to the Sri Lankan people right now? Well, I mean, see, um, we have to be strong as a country. Peaceful protest is accepted, and people has to uh, protest. Uh, if they don't like the government, they have to be vocal about it. If they don't like certain policies, they have to be vocal about it. But at the same time, we need to also be more vigilant as to what is happening globally. Mm-hmm. So, if we, if the plan is to create a crisis out of another crisis right so now what we see is we are using the crisis to create a crisis now we had a strong government now we don't have a cabinet so we are in a political crisis now and now we just hit 100000 tourists in march before april now dropping down massively tourism arrivals so you think that's happening because of the protest it is because who who wants to for example you will you and me will travel to any country because you are a journalist or a politician but who wants to go on a holiday where there is a crisis right so this is something that we need to um, think about and our exports are dropping because the fa- fa- factories are not functioning banks are not operating as it used to be so you cannot find a solution for a crisis through creating another crisis so i think we need to be more smart which is tough during, during the pandemic or during a crisis like this it's because you are angry youngsters are very very angry and they are frustrated so it is very difficult to think straight when you are angry and frustrated so i think this is something we sri lankan youngsters have to cool down and think and come out with a plan you know be more focused on as what you need what you want to achieve out of it so if you want to achieve disruption instability and a crisis then will it make any good that is what most of the political parties want because that will bring them to power because in sri lankan history if you look at the changing of governments have always happened through democratic way but through a crisis it has been always through a crisis for example you take from 1972 to 1976 then 1994 then 2005 when my father came into power then president sirisena and then you have president godabi rajapaksa so we all came into power through a crisis or some sort of instability But I don't think the next government has to come through that. So next government has to be elected with a plan and with a vision to address the crisis. So when you elect someone because of a crisis, that party or that people, that system will not be able to deliver what you want. So there is a big mismatch from what people actually want or why they elected and what they can actually deliver. So this is the right time, I believe, all the senior politicians. I mean, for example, my father has been there in Parliament fifty years on the Varani Vikram Singh, similar time. Dinesh Gunawat then, same almost forty plus years in Parliament. Then on the Sambandh then, almost forty fifty years in Parliament. Uh, on the Vasudev Nana Ekkar, a similar time of experience. So these politicians have to sit together and guide the rest of the Parliament and the youngsters, you know, young politicians in the Parliament. as to how we can first stabilize without stabling there is no way out of it and then of course you know engage with these youngsters all over the world sri lankans all over the world and even in sri lanka uh, and come up with a solid plan to come out of it you know because we need a progressive government we need we need progressive system actually to address our issues otherwise who is going to come and wait for 8 months or 12 months just to do an investment in our country because if the system doesn't allow an investor to come and invest overnight at least make it move faster because sri lanka is not the only location people can invest there are many opportunities globally so things have changed so for tourism sri lanka is not the only destination for travelers so there are many destinations they can uh, travel at this stage so you know this is what i think um, we have to think about moving forward So the unity that you're seeing on the streets right now amongst the people of Sri Lanka, you'd like to see that in the government as well. Well, see, uh, of course, I would like to see that in governance, uh, governance as well. But also, I would like to see the same unity uh, to build the country, not for crises. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Vandana Menon for the Print.